Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Saturday. Welcome to another College Readiness 2021. Um, this is our first in a series. We typically have this event on a, on a, on a whole day event where we have multiple sessions um, with the parents and students, and we focus on how to get you guys in college, how to help you get from high school into the college of your choice how to help you with your transition, how to help you with the financial aid applications, the scholarships. We, we focus on giving you guys information and, and equipping you with the tools that you would need to go out there and be successful. Um, and we really pride on, ourselves on our speakers, on our advisors, and we really appreciate the, the fact that they take the time out of their 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 normal lives to come out here and share this information with you guys. And we also have, um, normally we have students who are in college or who have graduated also come share their experience with you. Um, but right now during the pandemic, we don't really have that one-on-one -on -one interaction, but we still wanna be able to provide you guys the value, let you guys know that we are here for you guys. Um, this is our passion. We love to see you guys succeed we just do this out of our hearts because we want our community to continue to grow and be successful. Going from high school to college and then your professional careers. So we, we try to reach out to you from high school and when you get into college, we'll again try to connect with you. And NAMSI, again, will try to share, you know, professional opportunities, how to succeed as in whatever arena, how to buy a house and how to be an executive. So whatever level you are, um, I know this, this, this forum is for high school students, but I know you guys have friends and families um, in college, graduated or working, or parents that are, you know, looking to network and grow their career. I believe NAMSI is a place for everyone. And so we really hope that you um, join us, um, be a part of our community and, uh, we would love to have you if you have extra time to join us and be part of us. We, we're, we're welcome. We, we, we're hard workers, but we get things done. And so I really hope you guys enjoy today's presentation. Um, let me introduce Albert. I'll let Albert introduce himself. But Albert has been working with us for, I think, almost four or five years doing this. Um, and this, he's a pro. And um, I'll kind of let him introduce himself. But yeah. Albert, thank you so much for all that you do for your time for Nancy. Um, I know you're a busy family man, just like myself. So I really appreciate you taking time out your weekend to do this for us. Take Thank you. Time. Thank you. Yeah, so definitely, I, I think um, it's my pleasure to be here. My name is Albert Okabwe. I'm a CPA. The, why I'm here today is because, you know, I being a financial kind of person, I did keep pretty good records of my process from college to graduate school and, and, and finances and how I did that. And I had the experience of funding my self-funding virtually all of my college. So we're gonna talk about different things and I'll be able to speak about that from experience. I was not able to have my college just paid for by my parents when I was going to college, but we found ways and uh, we're gonna talk about those ways. Before we start, uh, for my, you have uh, access to the chat room. Can I get a sense of parents who are on this, on this uh, presentation who are listening? I wanna know how many parents or how many people are listening and their parent is right there. Uh, please, please type in if you have a parent that's with you. And if it looks like I'm on my phone, promise, I'm, I'm, it's my notes for this event. I, I don't multitask, I'm not good at it. Uh, let's see. So I wanna know which, how many parents are on this, on this event. Let me look at the... the parents are now, are now chatting in before they were just the students, but now they're... Okay, parents are chatting in, we've got some yeah. parents. Okay, the next thing I want you to do is type in, when you heard about this event, College Readiness, what were you most looking forward to hearing about? Folks, please, please just type in whatever comes to mind. 
I want to get a sense of what's most important to folks before I, I get going. Because as Uforma said, we have done this for a long time, actually closer to a decade, but yeah. <laughs> MC. So let's see. Where how do I see the chat? I guess I can't see the chat right now. Um I think if you just, exit your full your full screen, just, you might be able to just tell me what the what, what topics. All right, definitely. I'll 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 start with uh financial aid, how to save money, okay, scholarship tips, how to pay. Okay. Help with scholarships, free money, okay. scholarships and pricing. Okay. Private student loans. Okay. Merit scholarships. Okay. So they're definitely in the right place. Okay. All right. So I'm going to get going with the presentation. We have a lot of time. That's good. So I will not squander all of that time. Presentation is pretty tight. So I encourage everyone to think about that specific part of the presentation that maybe they have a question about. Type in the question into the chat while it's happening. I won't have that flowing right in front of me, but Reforma is on top of that. And we will have time to talk about some questions and, and other things that might come up that you wanna talk about in this forum. So I put this as a question because it is a question. The question is how will you pay for college? Okay. This presentation, probably the best thing I'm proud of about this presentation is I want to organize this thought process for you. Okay. I'm not just going to give you a whole bunch of information and say, here's this, here's scholarships, here's financial aid, here's this, here's that. We're going to try to organize this for parents so that you, parents as well as the students, so that you can, you know where, what comes first, what comes next, what comes next, what comes next. I also want to let parents who are listening know right now, you are, if you are stressed and nervous and you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, I don't have any money, trust me, you can still do plenty. And I'm, I'm a big believer in controlling what can be controlled. I think that in every aspect of life where we are successful, it is because we take responsibility for the things that we can take responsibility for. And you might be able to do 5% of the work, but it might be the first 5% that makes the other 95% possible. So I want everybody to feel empowered. And when you leave this, be feel like, okay, here are some things I can do. I'm going to get to it and we're going to move forward. All right. First thing I'll tell you about myself, like I said, I'm a CPA, I'm a financial guy or whatever that means. So that means that, you know, the money aspect of my life is one I pay pretty close attention to. I am a practicing CPA. Um, this topic is important because college is expensive, okay? Plain and simple. You don't want to just go and do it without thinking through it because it will cost you so much money that you can save so much money by how you handle it or you can make so much more money by how you handle it. So this is a big, big, big topic. A college degree is important for your finances. You know, for those Nigerians of us here, there are certain occupations that we are oriented into going into that you really can't get into without a college degree. Okay, you cannot become a CPA like I am without a college degree in a very specific subject. So for many of you, college is standing between you and the type of income you want to have or the type of work that you want to do to make a living right if if we all were going to earn the same amount of money every month we would regardless of what we did we still wouldn't pick the same thing okay so we'll talk about how to pay which seems very simple but it's a big enough topic to talk about and we'll talk about how to prioritize and you will have a chance to ask me some questions. And we're going to focus very heavily on ordering your process, ordering your thought process, what you should be doing at a certain point versus at another point, okay? There are many resources, it can get overwhelming, but if you leave here with a question or a specific area that when you leave here, you say, okay, this is a part that I can do something about, I promise you, 
when you go out and do any kind of research beyond what we tell you today, it will be so much more actionable and so much less overwhelming. And that's what I, that's what I try to do with this presentation. So how much does college cost? The purpose of this slide is not to give you the most up-to-date number, but to give you a comparison and get you thinking about the difference between these two schools. So if I tell you that University of Houston costs 12,000 a year and Rice University costs 49,000 a year, okay? Kids, what, what do you think? What's the, this, this Wi-Fi calling thing is a nightmare. Kids, what do you think is um, the reason that schools are so different? Please type in there. Why do you think U of H will cost 12,000 a year, Rice University, down the street, same city, costs $49,000 a year? Are the people going to Rice stupid or is, the, or is it that U of H just doesn't have any classes worth taking? What do you guys think? What do you see for me? Like top five. First couple of things people are thinking right now. Ranking private versus versus public. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Yes. So, so the two main obvious, so, yeah. So ra rankings, private versus public, those are those are things to think about. These don't include room and board or living expenses, these two numbers. And at this point, let me see here. These are undergraduate degrees only. So if you're getting a graduate degree at U of H, you're not gonna pay that 12,000 a year. It will cost more. And at Rice, it may cost more, okay? Public schools have government funding. Private schools may have some, gov have some government incentives they don't have direct funding, but you can get money that you can use to go to either one. So the first thing you need to think about is some schools cost substantially more, but will not give you substantially more value for the major or the field that you are in. I'll tell you guys a tip, a very useful tip that you might want to note. If you're in Houston right now, you have an advantage. Houston is one of the largest cities in America, okay? If you go to the cheapest, smallest school in Houston, you have a better shot at a prestigious job than some people who go to the best city in their town. Why? Because Houston is such a big city. There's so many big employers. There's so many big business opportunities that I believe ranking plays uh, it, you, ranking plays a lesser role in what you have access to if you graduate from a school in Houston, if you're in the city, compared to many other much smaller cities. So you, are already, you already have an advantage professionally by being in a major city. That's one of the, when I came from Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, and when people like me move from a not so huge city to a bigger city, there's something we're looking for, you already have it. In Houston. So first thing, four different ways how to pay for money, okay? Uh, parents, I have, I have given all of you a shout out on this thing, and it is a well-deserved shout out, okay? Free money, somebody will give you money, and the only thing you have to do for that money is go to college. Then there's money that comes from the student's pockets, okay? I know students are looking at their pockets right now and thinking, what money? I don't have any money. I have $2. But that's, we're talking about your money. And we can talk about how to get more money in your pocket. We can talk about parents' money. You know, parents, maybe you haven't saved anything. You haven't been able to save anything up to this moment for this child to go to college or for your children to go to college. But your money still counts. It's on the table. And then the last part, we're going to talk about borrowed money. That's money that you will have to pay back. So the first three is money you won't have to pay back. And the last one is money that you will have to pay back. Unless, of course, your parents, you know, ask you to pay them back, which I don't think that's possible. To happen. So first thing, when we call it free money, it's scholarships. Okay? Scholarships are free money. So parents and, and students... There's a couple of ways to get a scholarship. Some of this is obvious. Some of this you already know. 
but it's important to highlight them and be very specific about talking about them. Some scholarships are given to people because they're talented, okay? Maybe you're good at some, you're, everybody's good at something. This is the moment when I tell our African parents, I appreciate you. I thank you very much for everything you have done to bring your children to this point. Really, it is a big deal. You have done a hard job and a respectable job. I'm, a, I'm new to the game of parenting, like very new. So, you know, and I'm not that far away from being parented. We appreciate everything you have done. However, if your child is in high school and they are a freshman or sophomore, time's up. This is no longer the time to think about what you think they should do or what you think they should get good at. The meal is done cooking. You know, it's like when you come to the, when you come to the kitchen and you're cooking some soup and you're chopping onions, you have a lot of control over the flavor. By the time it's done cooking, it's cooked. I mean, what can you do but add some salt to it? Maybe pepper, that's about it. So right now you have to look at what are your children's legitimate talents? Maybe not your favorite talents that they have. Maybe not the thing you think they should be good at, but what are they actually good at? It's so a time to make that honest assessment. Kids can do this, but I'm sorry to say parents, they will only do it as well as you can. So if you can do it dispassionately, I don't care if your son is great at playing video games. If your son spends hours and hours every day playing video games, you need to write that down. There are scholarships, scholarships for people who like to play video games. You might not like that your son likes to play video games or your daughter likes to play video games, but if that's where we're at now, you need to write that down, okay? If they like to play a sport, if there is a an extracurricular activity that they will not stop doing. Maybe you tried to get them to stop, okay? At this point, you have to just put it on the list and say, hey, you've put in a lot of time into this. You need to go find someone who will give you money because you're good at this. And they'll look at you and say, but you don't like that I do this. And you'll say, it doesn't matter. You've done it, right? <laughs> you put in the time, you've become good at it. So you need to go and find out who will give you money to go to college because you're good at this. I had, I had the equivalent of a full scholarship to college, which paid for 120 credit hours. And that was for academics. You can think of it as academics. I had good grades. The reality of it was that I had a good college resume. I had good grades. I was in debate. I did some sports. I was track and field. Uh, I went to the state tournament in Missouri. So I had, a, I had a resume. I had a college resume. So we're talking about your kids resume. What are the things they put time into? What are the things that they are particularly good at? Write those things down. Parents, no one can do this job better than you can. You've known them from birth, okay? And don't let anyone tell you anything your child is good at that you didn't know before, okay? I, I will say that that, that, shouldn't, that probably won't happen. You already know about it. You just might not be, might not be your cup of tea. Video games are a big one, I promise. What's the catch? The catch is you have to go to class, okay? The catch is you have to actually do well at school. The biggest expectation of scholarships is a lot of them will have a GPA requirement. So mine had a, I believe it was a 3.25 GPA requirement or something like that. So I had to keep up my grades at a certain level or I wouldn't get subsequent semesters paid for, okay? Even athletic scholarships have GPA requirements just about every scholarship, especially if the scholarship is renewable. If you get a scholarship that is renewable, which means they'll pay for your first semester, but if you do well enough, they'll pay for the second. If you do well enough, they'll pay for the third and so on. Even if it's $500 a semester, they're gonna have some kind of expectation for how well you should do. That's the only catch with scholarships. And there's no limit to how many scholarships you can get. No, no, I don't know of many scholarships that say, oh, we're gonna give you a thousand dollar scholarship, but we need you to report to us how many scholarships you got. Because if you got more than that 49,000 that it takes to go to Rice, then we're not gonna give you any more money. There's very few situations where that will happen. Some very hardworking, diligent uh, kids who, along with their parents, 
are honest about what they're good at and what their selling points are can get more than enough money to go to go to college because they can just they can aggressively target people who give money for what they're good at. There is an app. Uh, I'm sure um, you could put it put it in there in the chat. Uh, Uforma. It's called Scholarly. S e h o l l y. I think. Uh, there's many scholarship apps out there you can use to search for scholarships, but I don't want you to start searching until you have that list of what your child is good at. Okay, do me a favor. Don't even start looking for scholarships until you have a list because you should know what, what type of scholarship your child will be competitive for. Okay, I didn't say every kid who plays video games should go and look for scholarships for kids who play video games. I said, if that's what you're, one of the things you're best at, you put a lot of time into, then you can go because these things are competition. You have to compete for these, okay? The good news is lots of scholarships available. That's the good news. The bad news is, like I said, only the best, okay? No one wants to give you a scholarship if you are not better than most people for whatever the scholarship is. And some scholarships are non-renewable. So if you're in high school, there are scholarships you can apply for. You'll get it year one, but after that, you won't get it again. I think there are actually more of those scholarships. So, and many of them are very small, 500 or $1,000. So you can rack them up if you put in the time. Everyone here can get scholarships, okay? Everyone here. Uh, the only person here who cannot get a scholarship is the one who, who isn't breathing anymore. Okay, that's the only one. Everyone here can get a scholarship. We, are, we all spend our time doing things and we all have God-given talents. And by the time you're a teenager, those things have come out. So here's my tip for scholarships. Apply, apply, apply sorry Albert, i didn't get that can you say that one more time i missed that apply <laughs> apply apply oh so you just said i should just apply apply as many times as i just keep applying yes apply as many times as you can for as many scholarships as you can okay this is, a, this is a contest, this is a competition. If your child is a junior right now, you are running out of time. So you need to apply for as many as possible. So when I said that you should have a list of what your child is good at first, it is a competition. When I was in high school, I believe I graduated with a 3.98. GPA or something like that. That's who you're competing with if you're competing for academic scholarships. Every, everything has a standard and you wanna go where you meet the standard and exceed the standard and feel comfortable competing. But don't be discouraged because sometimes there will be, you'll qualify but there won't be enough money for you. Very, very quick, short story. I told you earlier that I went to college with essentially a full scholarship, but I didn't tell you that there were 10 spots and I was number 11. And then one person dropped. Okay, so don't be discouraged by the number of scholarships you don't get because they won't tell your life story. The ones you do will. Standardized tests matter. So in my view, if you're, a parent, if, you're, if you're a junior, you should already have a standardized test score, depending on the schools, ACT, SAT. If you're a sophomore, that should be a priority right now. Parents, this is a big place where that, that, uh, that thing you call small money in your wallet makes all the difference. If you have a student who is a sophomore or younger, you don't have, have $100,000 saved for them to go to college, but you have $1,500, go and buy them a standardized test review course and spend money on them being prepared to do really well on standardized tests. Because unfortunately, 
standardized tests play a huge role in what scholarships your children can get and what schools they can get into. I'm not here to argue that this is a good thing. There are many critics of it, but it is the game. Play it. There are schools who will give you free tuition if you can just get in. A simple Google search will give you a list. There are schools who will give you free tuition if you can just get in. I have a list of some of the most prestigious and most recognized ones. But if it comes down to it and you don't want to pay for college, there are free tuition colleges. You can just Google it. There are free tuition colleges in America. Some schools, every student works 20 hours a week in the farm. And I think these schools are highly underrated. Why? If your child is going to go to medical school, the undergraduate degree should not cost you a lot of money, right? So, and the biggest thing that will get them into medical school is them taking certain classes, doing really well at them, passing certain tests, et cetera, et cetera. It is well worth your time and your effort and your uh, kind of expanding your comfort level for them to go to a school that costs you less. If they're going to go to a, if they're going to get a graduate or professional degree, I highly recommend essentially putting the cost of the education front and center and just insisting on the lowest cost education if your child is going to go to a graduate or professional education. Because that terminal degree is what will write their ticket <laughs> to their professional career, not where they started. Okay, I went to the University of Missouri, Kansas City, which is an excellent school that probably no one on this call has ever heard of. Okay, but then I got a master's degree at a University of Texas, Austin, which is an excellent school that probably everyone on this call has heard of. Okay, and as I live in Texas, nine times out of 10, no one ever asks where I went to undergrad. I have a CPA license and I went to UT Austin. Thank you, nice to meet you. Okay. I talked about talents earlier. Please promote them, okay? Actively promote them. Don't keep it to yourself, you know? Everybody's here on social media these days. I don't know how many of your parents are on social media, how many of your kids are on social media, but if you spend time, if you play, if you play soccer and you spend all your time posting pictures of cat videos instead of pictures of yourself playing soccer, you're doing yourself a disservice. Because I can tell you two, two things about promoting yourself. Number one, you need to promote yourself to the people who will give you a scholarship for what you want to do. Then number two, you need to promote your talents to your social networks. Because if you keep posting videos of yourself playing soccer, one of your aunties or your uncles will hear about a soccer scholarship and they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll say something. They'll say, hey, you play soccer. There's this scholarship I heard about for people who play soccer. Too much, too much time, I'm going on a little bit of a soapbox here, too much time on social media is spent posting what other people are doing and watching what other people are doing instead of what you are doing, okay? So get in the habit of promoting your own talents. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Parents, it costs you zero money to brag about every single achievement your children have on social media. If you're not doing it, start costs you zero money, okay? Don't, um, don't put any pictures of them they don't want you to put up, but it costs you nothing. If you're going to that soccer game every weekend, you need to be live tweeting that soccer game every weekend, okay? Everybody you know should know that your child plays soccer. That will help you, trust me. There are other scholarships. Scholarships are people who are left-handed. I'm left-handed, in case you haven't noticed. This is kind of a mirror image on the screen, okay? I'm Technically ambidextrous, but whatever, we can go down that road forever. So there are scholarships for people who are left-handed. There are scholarships for people who have low GPAs. Yes, some scholarships have a maximum GPA, okay? You just gotta look. Just don't, don't, don't start feel, by feeling defeated because let's say your child had had struggles in school and didn't manage to get above a 3.0 in high school. Well, someone, in their shoes became rich and famous and said, I wanna give people a chance who are just like me. So, so look anyway, free money, grants. This is money that you'll get from the government. 
you won't have to give back. Money you'll get from universities, you won't have to give back. Typically, you have to have a low household income, okay? You will be surprised how low, low needs to be. <laughs> okay, so I don't want anybody to think that because they're strapped for cash that they're a low, house, low income household. But you'll also be surprised how high your income can be and you're still a low income household, typically because of the number of kids you have or the number of kids you have in college and so on. Those, those you'll, you'll get through your financial aid application. Work study is a, is a thing where you work for the money. So it's not, it's free money, but you're going to work for it. So call that, I don't know how free that is, but it's, it's government grants. FAFSA, it's not March 15th right now. So we're past that. Uh, the biggest thing I'll say for FAFSA for people whose kids are juniors right now or younger is FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. This is what you need to fill out if you're going to uh, college in general. And this is the only thing you'll need to fill out if you're going to a public school. So if, you're, uh, if you don't have money saved to pay for rice, then you're going to a public school, you're gonna do FAFSA, okay? Now, if you go, the, the, there's a spring deadline, make sure you have tax returns filed on time from both parents so that that doesn't cause you problems. Uh, let's see, I will comment that private schools, I didn't put it here, but I'm not a big fan. I, I will literally talk out, try to talk every parent out of nurturing the dream and their children of going to some private school unless they can pay for it. Why? If Rice University costs 50,000 a year and you have a million dollars, that means that your first child will take a quarter of that money out of your pocket. The vast majority of millionaires I know cannot hand over $50,000 a year in tuition. Okay, they can't do it. They have a million dollars, but that's such a huge chunk. And so you should focus on the FAFSA because the FAFSA is more structured to cater to what I would consider the average millionaire who isn't just, who doesn't have an ATM in their house just spitting out money every day. Maybe you have a, a, a sizable house you, your family lives in, you have some sizable assets. FAFSA is more forgiving of that. If you go to private schools, they want you to pay out of whatever you've got. Uh, and a lot of assets that FAFSA says, hey, you don't have to sell this to pay for college. The private schools say, hey, you've got it, figure it out if you have, you know, so that's something I'll comment on. I never really talk about private schools because I think you should either pay for them out of pocket or get a scholarship. Uh, and you'll find that out as you go, whether you, that's, out, you, that's in, the, in the cards for you. I haven't, ha I don't have a private school uh, education. Hey, um, let, yes. me, let me jump in here. Sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of questions I want to just bring, yeah. your, bring to your attention. So earlier, somebody asked about 529. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping they'll give, get a chance to elaborate or go into more details about, why, about what they want to know about that, because there's mm -hmm. planning and there's front end about that. I'll let yeah, you know. 529 is a specialized, is basically a trust. Uh, it's a specialized account that the government, the government has written out a template for this account. If you put money in here and you use it for college, you won't have to pay any taxes on the growth in that account. That's what that is. I think it's much more of a relevant conversation for someone who says, hey, I've got all this money, or I've got all these relatives, and we want to put money in a place where it essentially cannot be used for any purpose other than college. Obviously, it can be, but you'll have to pay taxes if it is. So um, that's what I'll say about 529. That's all it is. It's, you know, 401k is for retirement, 529 is for college. And and, uh, and you will have to invest enough that it grows to where it covers college tuition. Um, that's that's probably the best. That's I'll leave it there for this conversation right now. So it's it's just a way to save money for college. It's not the only way to save money for college, but it is a savings vehicle that is specialized for paying for college. And you know, if you are fortunate and you have you know a lot of money. I've seen some clients who have half a million dollars in an account for 529 because parents have a lot of money or, or grandparents have a lot of money. You can use it to pay for private schools while kids are growing up. That's a new law. 
but it's essentially for education. Now, as far as sorry, yeah. uh, someone asked about scholarships for single parents, um, scholarships specifically for students going into the medical field. Um, I just want to, there's a comments there. Okay, yes. Comments or questions? Sorry, questions. Okay, yeah. So one thing I will say about medical, uh, we haven't gotten to the hold that thought for the uh, borrowed money, okay? Uh, but I will say this, as far as single parents go, sing, a single parent is more of a demographic issue. So you will have scholarships for people who, who were raised by single parents, just like you'll have scholarships for people who are left-handed. And that's what makes you eligible. Now, is are you going to get a scholarship because you have a single parent? Probably not. It's probably not something people compete on. It's, it's more... It's more the ticket into the game. It's not the VIP section. So that's something to that definitely look for that. If that's, if, if that's something, a demographic you belong to, uh, I think counselors in your high school will be good guides to whether you fit into a number of demographics that people are looking for, whether you are the type of person that people want to help more of them go to college. So for example, there's a huge push right now to get more girls and women into STEM. So you would just have to know that, your teachers will know that, your counselors will know that, that hey, you, this type of person, we want more people like this to get into this profession or to go to this college. So we have scholarships that only these people can apply for, or we have money that is only for these people. And you'll learn that as you look uh, the demographic stuff, you know some about your demographics. Let's see. Uh, parents. So can parents pay some of your college expenses? Answer is yes. Parents, you can pay some of the expenses. I would say that when I, uh, my, the total ticket for all of the education that I, I have is about a quarter of a million dollars. The total loans I can say that I, ha I graduated college with is about half of that. And out of that, those student loans, I would guesstimate that a third or more was living expenses or things related to living expenses like room and board and so on. So one of the things I would encourage parents to do is you can help pay for a car if that's all you can do, okay? If you just, if you just say, you know what, son, daughter, I don't have any money. What I can do is I can find a car and fix it and pay insurance on it so that you have a car. Trust me, I didn't have that, okay? I can quantify for you how much less debt I would have if my parents at 18 bought any car, paid for that car, paid the insurance on it, kept it in good repair, and just let me drive it. I would have saved thousands, okay? Room and board is a big one. Some schools are located in places where real estate is ridiculously expensive. Shout out to my UT, Austin is one of those places, okay? A lot of universities are located in a part of town where real estate is expensive. I don't know why that is. Someone else can, someone can tell me if they know. Uh, even U of H is located in a part of town where real estate is expensive. So your kids will spend a lot of money on room and board. You, have, you already have a house. So you can help them go to college from home and not have to pay for room and board. Uh, food is also quite expensive on college campuses. So if they live in your house, they can eat your food that they're already eating. So these are, these are the reasons, these are the, it's not just what you can spend out of pocket, it's what you can do to keep them from spending money. Now, the kids, you can work to save up for school, okay? If you are a senior right now, or younger, let me give you a tip that I can't even say that I knew when I started doing this presentation almost a decade ago. You ready? Because I don't even think Uforma has heard me give this one. There are a lot of paraprofessional jobs. Paraprofessional means like if you want to be a CPA, you can go and take a three to six month course and become a bookkeeper. Bookkeepers make between $15 and $25 an hour. If you can make $15 to $25 an hour while you go to college, cha-ching, 
you could, if you want to become a doctor or a nurse, you could first become a CNA, certified nurse's aide or nurse's assistant, whatever it may be. That takes a few months of training. I believe they make similar range of incomes. If you want to be an engineer, an electrical engineer, you could probably train to become an electrician first. They make good money. Don't wait for the degree to get in the field, okay? That's something I did not know. One of my friends in grad school used to joke, she used to joke with me and say, hey, we have college degrees, but we can't get a bookkeeping job, <laughs> you know? So I encourage you to think about that. You can work to save up for school, but either part-time while you're in high school or after you turn 18, before you go to college, there are courses you can take that put you in that field and start earning you well above minimum wage while you go to college. And I think uh, parents, I encourage parents to discuss this with the kids and don't look at it as a diversion or as distraction because we worry that, oh, he's not gonna get the electrical engineering degree because now he's an electrician making $30 an hour. Why will he ever want to get an electrical engineering degree? You know? If the worst thing that happens to your kid is that they don't go to college because they're now making good money and paying their own bills, which is what you always wanted them to do, I think you're doing okay. Okay, if that's the worst thing you have to worry about, I think you're doing okay. Working through college, I already mentioned that. You can train, when you train in any of these areas, you can work while you're in college. A lot of employers prefer people who worked during college. I didn't work all that much in college, to be honest, in hindsight, and it would have saved me more money if I had uh, focused on it and tried to do it more. Paying for college after, after graduation, that's me, okay? That's borrowed money, okay? You borrow money, they don't make you pay any of it until you graduate. Federal student loans, private student loans, always ask about interest. I'm gonna run through this because of time. Federal student loans comes from the government. Private student loans does not come from the government. The most important thing you should ask is, is the loan subsidized or unsubsidized? Parents, you can write this down. Anytime they give you a quote unquote financial aid package, check to see if there are loans in it because loans are technically called aid. Check to see if there are loans ask whether the interest is subsidized or unsubsidized. If it is unsubsidized, then you will pay all the interest eventually. If it is subsidized, the government pays the interest while the student is still in college. You should ask about this, it makes a world of difference. Another pro tip for the parents, if your child borrows $100,000 and the interest is 6%, which is 6,000 a year, you could probably pay 6,000 a year while your child gets a $100,000 education, as opposed to compounding $100,000 to $126,000 over four years. So if you think you can't do anything, you can at least pay the interest on those student loans. Uh, and student loans don't get discharged in bankruptcy, so be very careful about how much of them you take. Let's see. So I'm gonna try to put this together. Standardized tests up to junior year, standardized tests up to junior year. Junior year, you should already, you should be getting a score. By senior year, going to the fall of senior year, it's all about those, those uh, scholarships. By fall of senior year, it's all about the scholarships. You should already have the standardized test done. You should be applying to colleges applying for scholarships. Second semester of senior year, you should be done applying for as many scholarships as you can. And at this point, you, you'll just try to find out what financial aid you qualify for and what student loans are available, okay? I recommend public university that is in state and close to home. Close to home means cheaper, okay? If you live in a major city like Houston, University of Houston, uh, I come from another large city, much smaller than Houston, 
And I can tell you, U of H has far better attention from employers and opportunities for students as a public university inside a city than most cities have. So U of H is, is good enough by any means. I'm, I didn't go to U of H, they're not paying me for this. Decide on a major quickly. Remember the thing I said about your kids' talents, parents? I see some faces, please nod. Do you remember? Okay. You've got to help them make sure that they are in a space they should be so that they can get in and get out. <laughs> okay. More than half of American students take six years or more to get a college degree. By God's grace, this will not be your portion. Your child should get in and out of a degree in four years. The biggest reason people take too long is they delude themselves, my opinion, about what major they should be in. They go for the highest paying major. They go for the major that'll impress their parents the most. That sounds good if you can do it, but instead they drop out. I think Ufoma, you did some kind of engineering, right? I think you just, just not. You did some kind of engineering, right? They have a lot of dropouts from engineering programs. Okay, I know everybody looks at the paychecks and they wanna go work for Exxon. Um, that, that major chews more people up and spits them out than you can imagine, okay? So some of them end up in accounting, which is where I am. Community college is very helpful because it's cheaper, okay? Like I said, if you're, uh, if you're gonna end up at uh, a good school or you're gonna go to graduate school, then why pay for the first two years? Why pay the most money for the first two years? Uh, I don't, I've never heard a good reason, okay? I didn't go to a community college. Um, that doesn't mean I don't, I don't wish I did. And then for the kids, I have a tip. This is another one that parents can help with. Parents, there's so much you can do. Don't you see how much you can do? Please type in for me if you feel like I gave you more things you can do to help with this. Please type in there. I wanna know where you are on this. One more thing you can do. If your child is going to leave your house and go and live somewhere else to go to college, they need to know how to cook the, th the two things that you cook that they like to eat the most. They need to know how to cook it. Too many times kids go to college and don't know how to cook. I just told you the school is very, very expensive. I mean, food is very expensive on college campuses. And the kids who don't know how to cook have to spend a lot of money on food, okay? And typically they'll just eat out or they'll buy the expensive campus food. So, uh, you know, I encourage you, the kids, I say, I say that you should know how to cook your favorite two dishes and how to make a pizza. Because when you go to college, they're gonna constantly give you pizza. They're gonna try to sell you pizza. Pizza is a piece of dough with tomato sauce and your favorite toppings and cheese. That's what pizza is. You should learn how to make pizza. I make pizza with a five-year-old, a six-year-old, and a seven-year-old every once in a while. So if you know how to make your own pizza, you're gonna be better off. Uh, let's see, what else did I say? Mm, okay, I'll say the, this is a little bit of jargon. When you do financial aid, they have a number called the expected family contribution. That's what they expect that your family should pay for your child to go to college. That's a little bit of jargon. Um, and I, I encourage you to not go it alone. So parents, a suggestion for you, especially uh, if you're involved in community organizations, cultural organizations such as NAMC and um, churches, ask around for someone whose child is one or two years older than yours. Okay, one or two years older, I'd say that you will learn a lot from someone whose child is one or two years older than yours. You'll hear what they wish they were doing when they were where you are. Uh, also, it will help if you and some of your children's friends, parents, put your heads together, okay? If, you, if your son plays soccer and this other person plays soccer, you, if you can get out of the competitive mindset, two people looking for opportunities to go and play soccer and get a scholarship at a school can find more opportunities and do better. Don't go it alone. It's just not necessary. 
I can think, you know, I've in my life so far, I can say that anything I failed very quickly at was something I tried to do by myself. <laughs> so I don't encourage you to go, go it alone. Uh, let's see. I think that was it. Uh, anybody have any questions or anything that I said that needs to be, that you'd like me to say more about? Let me look here. I'm dying to see this chat that I that I'm, I I couldn't see. I know um, someone asked questions about, or they want to learn some more about the standardized testing. Um, and I also okay. want to let you guys know this is one part in a series. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a follow up session where we have another speaker come focus on mm -hmm. testing, perfect essays, and applications. So. So with that, so with that in mind, what I will tell you is that um, you will get much more details out of a presentation like that. All I'm going to tell you is that you need to be done testing. Okay, you need to be done testing with enough time so that you can use those scores to get scholarships and get into schools. That's one. Number two, standardized test performance is not correlated to how well your child is doing at school, because Every test is essentially a game and you can't win a game if you don't know the rules. And I took some, a little bit of my story. I took the ACT and the SAT when I was a teenager. And I, um, I did a, a review course with software. So my parents couldn't buy, buy those live review courses that maybe may cost you one to $3,000. But I bought a $50 software, okay, which I'm pretty sure every parent here can buy. There's probably some, some stuff online. And I used it, and essentially the software taught me how the, how the test was arranged, what types of questions, and just all these different things like the lay of the land, so that when I go into a test, I'm not seeing anything I don't expect to see. I might not get, get the answer right, but I know that there'll be a question that looks like this. I know that there'll be a question that looks like that. You know, and also for me, being born and raised outside the U.S., I came to the U.S. right freshman year, high school. Outside the U.S., you don't do multiple tests, multiple choice tests as much. So I had to learn a lot about how to take multiple choice tests and how to eliminate my answers and, and how to manage my time. So I, I, I highly encourage you to, the less money you have, <laughs> the, more, m the more of it to put freshman and sophomore year on getting your child ready to do the best they can on standardized tests. Oh, okay, campus tours. Somebody asked about campus tours. Okay, so the person who's asking about campus tours, are you a parent or a student? Parents, all right, good. Um, might not like my answer, but I don't think you should. I don't think you should worry too much about that. Um, I think if you can go and see the campus, go and see the campus. When I was in when I was in high school, I got a letter from Yale. Okay, I'm not not saying it to say I got into Yale. I did not apply and I didn't get in, but I got a letter from Yale and they gave me a scary statistic that kind of formed how I looked at colleges. They said that more, all, more than 90% of people are satisfied with their college experience, more than 90% of people. And they said, we're not going to try to tell you that we are the only school that you will go to and be happy with and be satisfied with. And the moral of this story, what I'm trying to tell you is that schools will try to tell you, oh, we have this here. We have that here. You will have this experience. We'll be, we're five miles away from that event. The reality of the matter is that college is kind of like a marriage. You know, there's so much you have to put into it to make something good out of it that, you know, uh, the, the, it's, you need to focus on that part. When the child gets there, they will have so many opportunities to make the experience worthwhile for themselves. So you're, you, what you should be focused on uh, is not visiting 10 or 20 schools. I mean, I don't have any problem with visiting the one or two schools that you apply to or the one or two schools that are top of mind. I had visited the school that I ended up going to 
you know, but I think it's overrated. That's, it's just my opinion. I think it's overrated. I, I don't, you know, if your child has to pick between UT Austin and Texas A&M, fine, visit them both, but don't, don't spend your whole year uh, visiting schools. And if you don't, and some of these schools, you know, some of these schools, you know, it'll be fine. You know, it'll be fine. They have buildings, they have teachers, they have classes, you know, it'll be fine. And, and let, me, let me jump in here on something you mentioned earlier about tips to save and really, really emphasize it. Community colleges. Again, community college can save you a lot of time and money. Um, a lot of people are either scared or ashamed of the, because they feel like community college is such a small school and it won't give you the name. But you can go to community college and at a four-year college at the same time. Yes. Um, yes. I went I to Texas A&M and Blinn. So while I was in a and in the main school year, I was also taking classes in the summertime at Blinn. But those classes were, were, were half the price mm. and a lot easier and in fact, even smaller. So you had more success in, in those classes than at a bigger school like Texas A&M. And another mm-hmm. thing is, um, especially schools where it's like A&M are, blind, are, are brother sister schools. So it's easy to transfer. There's, there's okay. really no issues at all. Um, there, there's, and you, for example, University of Houston and HCC. You have that same CD opportunity to where you're taking some of the same classes, especially the first, the, your first two years of college, where it's the non-major specific classes. You're able to take those, um, Poli sci classes, those um, history, extra, uh, those English. English, English classes. Take that, take take that in community college. You know, get it out the way. Knock it out during the summertime. Um, you have, you have your summer. Do it, and um, and then when you get your major ready, go, jump back into your four year college. Mm-hmm. You save a lot, so, of, save a lot of money. So a couple of different things. I'll, I'll try to talk talk to. Uh, Community college, you can do it the same time as you're in a four-year college. Uh, you, you, we now live in a post-COVID era, so there are many online colleges you're going to be able to take. Actually, some of you have access to online colleges that you can take, or community colleges you can take while you're in high school. Okay, if especially the parents who feel like their children can handle high course load or academically very strong, you know, by sophomore year, junior year, that is worth considering. Looking at can they take classes in the summertime at a community college? I actually took some college credits in high school, uh, three or uh, two classes, I think, math and college English and college algebra. So there's college classes you can take in your school while you're in high school at the community college. While you're in high school, you can go to community college. When you're out of high school, you can go to community college when you're at the college, the four-year college at the same time. These are all options to you, okay? And as college becomes more and more competitive, some of these online schools will be a bargain, okay? Uh, The comment about, should you get a job at a fast food place now until you're old enough to become a CNA? Why not? I don't see any reason why not. If your goal is to make money and get gain, gain some work experience, I'll give you a tip, okay, with a fast food job. Uh, I would try to... um, I would try to make that a place where you can get a good reference, okay? So, you know, try to have some interactions with whoever is in charge, the manager, maybe the owner, because anybody who can say this person is a good worker is is an asset to you. I have been an employer and I have seen that, how that works for people. So definitely go for it. Medical school, yes, I said I'll talk about that. So medical school, there's a thing called public service loan forgiveness, okay? So if you go to college and you get federal student loans, you can work for a nonprofit, a governmental institution, including schools and the edu- education. And if you work for them for 10 years, you can get your student loans forgiven. I think this is, I think this is a big opportunity for people in healthcare because many healthcare organizations are nonprofits. Many hospitals 
are nonprofits. So if you go, so if you're uh, if you're going into those areas, that's something you should be mindful of and think about. To my knowledge, the nurse at a hospital that's a nonprofit doesn't get paid a whole lot less than the nurse at a hospital that's a for-profit. So I don't see why that's not a major consideration for people. Also, if you're going into medicine, uh, it's med medicine doctors, dentists, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, all these different areas, there are government, there's government money to pay for your school and in exchange, you go and work somewhere. It could be somewhere remote. It could be in a Native American reservation or something like that. It could even be in a zip code serving underserved communities. You could get a job here in Houston in an area that is predominantly black or low income or minor, other, other minorities and you can get your student loans forgiven and that's the condition of you getting a college paid for. There's uh, federal funding for that sort of thing. So I definitely would look into that for uh, people who are gonna go into medicine, uh, medical fields. I definitely would look into that. Uh, if you can serve an underserved community in a major city, you don't really have the, the thing that many people are trying to avoid, which is being in the middle of nowhere, so to speak, right? So I would look into that, but that's more something to think about when you're in college, okay? Some universities do not accept AP classes. However, they will accept dual credits. Absolutely. I think that there are enough good universities that will accept these things. I think especially if you are going to go to graduate or professional school, you should be going to a school that will accept these things so that you can win. Because ultimately, eventually, you'll go to a graduate school and you will prove yourself by going to the highest ranked, most wonderful graduate school. Okay, uh, let's see. Somebody said Chick-fil-A gives scholarships. Yes, most, em most employers that employ teenagers will have scholarships. Your church probably has scholarships. Uh, those are all places you can look for scholarships. Uh, the thing about money which you're able to use for college that is tax-free. Well, federal grants for you to go to college are tax-free. Scholarships are largely tax-free. Uh, I wouldn't... Um... You're talking about the 529. Oh, the 529. Okay. Well, 529 is similar to a 401k, right? 529, you put money in there and it grows tax-free. So if you put $100 in next year, it's $110. You don't have to pay any taxes on the $10 additional that it has grown. And, in a, and the deal you have is that you use this money to pay for a higher educational institution. If you take the money out and don't use it to pay for tuition, you will have to pay taxes on every dollar that you took out. That's how it works. 529s are tax deductible in states that have state taxes. Texas is not one of those states. So uh, I will say that I, I don't, uh, I think that the financial aspect of a 529 is under is maybe less in Texas because you don't get a tax deduction from the state taxes because there are no state taxes. But that's essentially what I would say about a 529. It's it's for saving for college. And as far as this conversation goes, I wouldn't put a 529 as a major part of your thought process if the child has already finished middle school. There's four years to go to college. You know, it'll help you, but the vast majority of what you can do over a four year period is prep for standardized tests, apply for scholarships, go to the cheapest school. That's, that's what you need to be focused on. Now, if you're, if you're, uh, like me and your children are very little, then yes, definitely 529, start socking some, some money away, however much, however little, just start, even if it's $500 a year, just start, start saving money and, and it'll be useful someday. Any more questions, thoughts, concerns? Uh, Ufwama, can you please give some more details about the other events in the series? Yes. So that folks can uh, can know exactly what they have to look forward to. Yes. 
So we are definitely going to have one more session in two weeks that's going to be focused on, maybe, maybe three weeks, I'm not quite sure yet, focused on your application process. So your testing, your scholarships, and timing for your application. Um, I think that's, that is a big deal to people who, like myself, who have never done a scholarship. I came from Nigeria when I was 15. I came in the summer and I had to start trying to get into school in the following fall. So I was lost. And <laughs> hopefully, so most of you guys are not in the same boat as I was. But if you have, um, if any of you are, if you're a senior or you're junior, and this is, this is your parents' first time having a, a young one going to college, this is going to be new for them. So that's, that session is going to be for you guys to kind of help them get ready as well as know, you know, follow up with the advisors, what they should be doing to get ready for, for that, for those applications. It's really, a, I think, a three-year process before you graduate. Mm -hmm. Start off your sophomore year. So if you have kids that are sophomore year and juniors, this is a session for them. At, that, at seniors, at that point, they should already have things down packed. So that's the first thing. Application, testing, all that. The next session we'll have, it will be focused on seniors. And I think Albert has done this before. Helping them with their transition to college. What things they should be getting, how they should be getting ready for the challenges, time management, spending, study habits, um, the little things that help you be successful your first year and prepare you, prepare you to, for graduation. So we'll have that in about another month. Um, and that will be for seniors and parents because we also want to talk to parents and kind of have a discussion of how the parents can really assist students in preparing for that first year in college. Because it's, it's a team effort. Don't just drop them off there and leave them there by themselves. What kind of conversations can you guys have that would help them or encourage them to be the best they, they, they can be? So those two sessions we're definitely going to have uh, one in three weeks or two weeks and another month from now. Um, you guys get all information. Um, well, before we kind of close things out, um, Albert, if you can talk some more about tips for seniors or first year um, college students, what things can they watch out for as they are becoming young adults um, or what habits they, they can start? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, they, you've, they you've said one of them. So I would probably say that time management is something that I struggle with even now. I think that young, I think that they should get very good, they should start practicing time management. Let me put it that way. So so kids, if you have a smartphone, if you don't have a smartphone, you probably can get an agenda book. So my wife calls hers an agenda book. And write down what you're going to do every week. Write down what's going to happen in the future and get into the habit of living off of a plan of some kind. It will help you to be prepared for the future when there will be more things you have to keep up with. I'm always very disappointed, I will say, when someone forgets an appointment with me and shows up with an iPhone. And I say to myself, don't you know that thing has a calendar where you're supposed to, when we decide we're going to meet, that's where you put it. You write it down on there, you put an alarm, you know. So I think time management is a big one. I think be honest about whether or not you are, well, this is for the parents. I think parents should have a conversation slash negotiation with the children about whether they are ready to be out of the home. Um, I was out of the home at 18 and went to college, but that's not, but at the same time, I was 30 minutes away on campus. <laughs> so some people go further, some people go close, some people go to college from home for a few years have that conversation, have that negotiation, because some kids aren't ready, but some kids are. Uh, that's as far as preparing and what, kid, what uh, the kids should think about. I think time management is number one. 
Uh, I want to also reiterate slash uh, leave everybody with, you know, it's, it's a lot of information. So parents, if you don't do, <laughs> somebody said that not every 18 year old is academically ready for college either. Hmm. No comment on that. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's true too. That's true too. So like I said, be very honest about what, where your child is. You've tried and tried and tried to get them to want to, to get them to be a doctor. And if by 16, 17, they're not passing science classes, please don't think that this is a good, a good, a good way for you or them to spend time or money. So my homework for parents is make a list of what your child is actually really good at. Better than most kids. Hint, they do it better than most kids or they do it more than most kids. You might not know anything about video games, but if you feel like they spend too much time on video games, put it on the list. Kids, I want you to make the same list and meet with your parents and compare notes. That's, that's probably the biggest thing I'll suggest that everybody do here. And everything you do from here, should be, that is the foundation to me. That's the foundation. Don't, uh, don't tell yourself anything that is not true. And, and when you know what is true, when you and your child agrees, you can really go for it in terms of looking for scholarships, looking for opportunities to develop your child, looking for the right school, for the kind of talent that your child has, everything. Uh, and parents, don't give up. You've got this. Okay, we have That's about 10, 10 more minutes. Any, any more questions? Anyone yes. want to speak and jump in here? We would like to hear someone else's voice, if yes. anybody. He's tired of hearing my voice, folks. <laughs> Um, but before we close out, I do want to mention a lot of parents have been emailing us asking about scholarships. Um, in the past, we've had scholarships post one of our events, like a career discovery or college readiness events. Um, but we haven't done that in a while. But we are definitely trying to roll out a new scholarship right now. And it's not just a scholarship, guys. Uh, it's basically a uh, a college prep class uh, program that we scholarships program that we're trying to kick off. It's going to be for students in their sophomore year, going in, going into their junior year, um, and the the, the basics is that we want to assist them in applying for scholarships, applying for college, and give them the information and kind of hold the student's hand to get them to the college of their dream. So you all will receive an email regarding that, this scholarship in the next week or so. So please, if you have a sophomore, you're Nigerian, you're here in this chat, please apply. It's not just free money. We want to equip you with the tools to actually go out and get more scholarships. So it's, uh, it's let me come here, let me help you kind of thing. So it's definitely, it's definitely better than just us giving you $500 or $100 or $1,000. This is a place to get more and have mentorship through um, your junior, senior, and until you get the college of, um, acceptance of your dreams, okay? So please look out for that. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Albert. Thank, thank you, Uche. Um, we, have a, we have someone jumping in to speak, a kid. Go for it. <laughs> Some, somebody, someone is really excited. Class of 2030. <laughs> 20, 20. And please, uh, thank you guys for making the time. And I know things are hard in 2020, but these are the kind of things that you can be doing to make sure your kids and yourselves are, are, are uh, prepared for what else is, what, what else 2020, what has to come. Um, stay safe. And stay blessed. And thank you, Albert. Thank you, parents, for taking the time. Thank you, students. And stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.